My name is Candace Daiwan. I am the VP of Creative at 50 Plus One Strategies. And I am super thrilled to be chosen again to do this training for Netroots. I have in the past few years been really lucky and um, honored to have been chosen to give this training before. So just with that caveat, if you have joined my training in the last few years, whether it's in person or online, this will have some of the same stuff. So um, I know that there's a lot of really amazing things happening at the exact same time. I want to attend them myself. So I won't be hurt if you've already taken this and you want to go check those out, feel free. Um, but yeah, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, again, I'm Candace Daiwan. I'm proud to be the daughter of Filipino, Filipino immigrants. I was born and raised in Hawaii. I grew up on the leeward side of Oahu. So if any of you are familiar with that, I graduated from Milani High School. That's how you know. Um, and I actually graduated in computer animation back in the mid 2000s. Um, and I got my start working in politics as an organizer on the ground as like a summer organizer for Obama 2.0 in 2009. And so I've actually been lucky enough and uh, thrilled to work with a lot of really amazing people and volunteers over the over the years. And I've um, picked up a lot and I'm really thrilled that I get to combine my creative side with my organizing side. Um, and I currently work at 50 Plus One Strategies and we're a consulting firm that helps with political campaigns and with um, nonprofit organizations and a lot of other really cool advocacy stuff. So um, let's get started. I'm glad that my sound is finally working. I am watching the chat, but I actually can't join the chat. Uh, so I will kind of just audibly respond to stuff. Hope you guys are doing great. Let's uh, get started. And I'm assuming everybody can see that, right? Uh, the name I, of the company that I work with is 50 plus one strategies. I popped it on the bottom of that slide there. So really quick, uh, I wanted to, this is gonna require a little bit of uh, participation on your part uh, in the chat. Um, so first of all, if you could rank yourself, you know, one through 10, um, how would you rank your design skill experience? And the reason why I do this is I always like to kind of see who I'm working with and um, you know what kind of level you guys are looking at. Great, we got a five. Just adjusting this so you guys can see it better. There we go. Got three, fours, fives. Great. 6.5, seven. Awesome. One of these days, I'm going to get a 10 in here, and then you, I'm, and then I'm going to ask you where you're teaching your class. Great. Cool. So we're kind of like fives and sevens. Um, and actually, I'd, I'd like to know how many of you never thought you were going to do graphic design, but have been kind of thrown into it because you're like a digital person or you're the only person at your firm that is good at computers or your group. I'm going to keep moving on, but um, yeah, <laughs> I have a feel I, I, every year that I do this, it's actually been less professionals who are trained in graphic design and more uh, people who have been kind of thrown into it. Um, and the reason why I love doing this training is because I think that, you know, design should be left to the professionals in a lot of ways, but a lot of times you don't get to choose the fact that you just became a design professional. So I'm hoping that I can help you guys out with some uh, some over overarching concepts that can help you regardless of what program you guys are using. So this uh, regardless of what program you all are using. Um, so this won't be necessarily like an Adobe tutorial. You can find those online. But what I wanted to go through is some of the basic things about, you know, psychology of design, some of the ways that you can communicate it as a, as a designer. And then also just like a few tips about what happens if you're kind of hitting a wall, either with uh, the person that wants you to do a design or yourself. Um, so let's move on. So. Just a couple of the examples of some of the designs that I and my team uh, at 50 plus one have done over the years from literally the biggest thing that I've designed, which is the Gavin for Gavin Newsom for governor. You guys have probably heard a little bit about that over the last year. Uh, the Gavin Newsom for governor, his original run in 2018, uh, his bus wrap. I absolutely love doing bus wraps. If anybody wants me to do a bus wrap, hit me up. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, to billboards, 
uh, mailers uh, to, you know, gifts online um, and digital ads. So we've done a lot of different things and always learning and always adapting. Um, so one of the big things that when I started doing art, is I realized that you're not really necessarily like learning how to draw. You're not, there's not really, there are ways that you learn how to draw, for example, but the biggest thing that really clicked for me was realizing that design and drawing and art really is just changing how you see and how other people see and realizing how other people see things as well. Um, one small caveat, a lot of these things that I'm gonna go over, do you take into the fact that it is a neurotypical um, person, neurodiverse people might view things a little bit differently. So obviously this isn't going to encompass every single person, but it will encompass a lot of people. So uh, in the chat, I'd like for you to just quickly describe, if I'm showing you this, what do you see? How would you describe the, this screen? Squares. Great, Cassidy. <laughs> I think maybe some of you weren't expecting to have to jump to the three squares, three right, alternating red and white blacks. Great. What about this? What would you call this? I am trying to also, I understand that sometimes people are a little behind with the great pairs, groups of two. Awesome. How about this? There's no right and wrong answer, by the way, you guys. I see in the chat, you're saying somebody said it better. It's fine. <laughs> A grid. Great. I can tell you guys are fives and sixes in here because you use the word grid. What about now? What would you describe this as? Just realize that since this is going to be recorded, there's people in the chat that are saying that this is a grid. Um, Full rows of six squares, red state. Now that I've changed it to this one, visual data set, outlier, data representation, highlighting one out of 24, corporate, Florida, real great answers here. Um, and what's really fascinating to me is that every time I do this for different groups, Netroots, you know, you always see, I've heard people say at Netroots say like gerrymandered, voting, uh, districts, outlier, uh, you know, um, election night results and if i do this with another group that's not electoral they'll say like it's red it's blue it's connect four um you know like it's really interesting who who brings what to everything and that's kind of where where i'm trying to get at is that we need patterns so every single one of those things um you guys all yelled out things that you have you know one you said it's red it's pairs it's every other one it's data set um, and we need patterns. And why is that? It's because when we were, you know, just starting out as humans, we saw if a horse ate nightshade and it died, maybe we shouldn't eat nightshade. And a lot of those pattern decisions made it so that we are now walking around, you know, because our ancestors decided not to eat the nightshade. Um, so going back to what I had shown you originally, you know, these are just pixels, like on a very base level, these are just pixels I just chose to make parts of it red and the other parts are like very light beige um and so your brain has actually put this all together and said those are squares and you're not wrong but it's also just it's an optical illusion it's all visual everything you know is really just visual and down um down to the basics and so one of the really like one of the really first tenets about um design that i want to talk about is that we assume that objects are close in proximity belong together and I know that sounds really obvious, but there's a lot of times where people don't really use this concept. And it's really one of the easiest concepts that you can use to make your design good. And also, it's a really uh, easy concept to use to make sure that your designs aren't confusing either. Um, what do I mean by this? Here's like a really quick example. <clears throat> if you were to guess that this design that I made back in 2014, which feels like it's both last year and 20 years ago to me, um, 
Uh, what would you guys say that Yes on C does based on just seeing this flyer? And thank you guys for being in the chat. I appreciate it. Helps school, school funding, helps kids. Supports school kids, good for kids. Now, if you were to try and explain why you immediately thought that, what I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? But like, let's just, one of the things that I wanna do during this training is to kind of point out obvious things that maybe you haven't noticed, but what are the things that tell you that it's good for kids? I'm not reading them out loud. I'm so sorry, Martha, what do you mean I'm not reading them out loud? The People are saying happy kids, kids are smiling. Positive of kids, great. Happy kids, awesome. So let's just break this down. There's even more to that too, right? When I made this, um, some of the things that, some of the concepts that people really wanted in it are, we, the letter C, I curled it to make it look a little bit more like blocks. I put it into, you know, a little bit of a curve so that it was a little bit more fun, had a little bit more dynamic movement to it. Um, uh, there's a child figure in the C, people have said, backpack imagery of children, C in the figure. I know that you might be a little behind, so uh, the backpacks attach it to a school, perfect. Um, and on this too, right, like just little decisions that we made that make a big impact. One, we use smiling children, so it's good for kids. Um, two, I use really bright colors, so um, evoking like crayons and blocks and kids' toys. Three, uh, we used red and white and blue because we wanted people to know that this is something that wasn't necessarily along partisan lines, that it helps everybody. Um, and then three, when I drew the silhouette, I used a, a picture of one of my friend's daughters uh, to try and make sure that the hair wasn't just like, um, you know, one type of child that we're showing that we're, we're going to be helping out lots of different kinds of kids. And through the campaign, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, at the beginning of the campaign, we hadn't had the chance to do like a real photo shoot yet. So this is actually a stock photo. Um, and the fun thing about this that I always point out is like, you know, this is a stock photo. These are probably kids that are like in Vancouver. This was something that was passing in San Francisco in 2014. These children will never benefit from Yes on C, and yet they are helping, their images are helping people understand the relationship between happy children and voting Yes on C. Um, you can also use this on the flip side, right? Like if anybody in here is from Kansas or in places that have tornadoes, um, this particular storm is a very specific type of cloud storm that happens right before a tornado. And that might not be something as me from Hawaii wouldn't immediately recognize, but you are sending this mailer to people in Kansas and they know that immediately and they associate that with negativity, uh, putting a black and white photo that's really high contrast, looks like a mugshot. Um, because you've seen mug shots before and you know that this is negative, picking photos of your opponent that aren't flattering, that make them look upset, make them look angry all the time. And then um, other things like having a yellow line all the way across the bottom, it kind of reminds people of like the do not cross line, there's caution here. Um, there's a lot of really interesting choices, even just the basic choice of the um, headline rips, which I use a lot myself, like it makes people go, oh, those are from newspapers because it's ripped from the headlines or it's ripped from newspapers. Just a lot of these smaller decisions that are made when you're designing that evoke patterns and um, let people remember things because you're you're using associations. Um, and on the positive side, like whenever you can use real photos of people, in this case, this is a, um, a mailer that was sent out to union members, using actual photos of union members. One, it shows the um, the people, the real people that are there to, you know, real photos give you um, give you a familiarity that stock photos just don't. And then three, if somebody recognizes somebody, you got a really strong connection there as well. Uh, so this is my favorite part here, shell time. Just really quick, I'm going to show you this. What do you guys see in the chat? I know I said it was shells, so you're going to be like, I see shells, Candace, of course. Eyes. Great. Where do you see the eyes? 
a frog. Baby's heads. The panic of frog. <laughs> Smiling a face, a smiley face. A face texture of fish. Great. This is actually one of my favorite pictures that I found. And every time that I see it and I use it, I, I kind of associate different voices with this guy. Like he's got like, hey guys. Um, the really neat thing is that it's actually, there is no living thing in this picture. Um, and what I wanted to point out to you is that we are wired to find faces. They've done a lot of studies on this. One of the ones was in, um, one of the main ones was in 1997 that people uh, tend to see faces in the most abstract places. Um, so again, these are just shells. Like I, I thought that was an eel. I thought that was like a frog at first. And even when I switch away and I switch back, it's really hard to not look at the face in this. And I think it's just such a powerful draw um, for people. So <clears throat> why is that? There's two things happening here, apophenia, which is the experience of seeing patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. Vegas runs on this. Um, and then there's pareidolia, which is the specific perceiving vague and random stimulus as being significant. Um, and as I do that, every year that I do this and the average age of the audience gets younger, they don't quite know what this image on the right is. Who knows what this image on the right is of the face? Anybody? Any guesses? Might be behind. Alien, just a face on Mars. Thank you, Jeanette and Ken Tare Contari. I'm, I'm so sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, so back in the 70s, when we got our first images back from the satellites, everyone really, really, really wanted it to be aliens. Everyone was like, there's going to be pyramids, there's going to be a lake, there are going to be ruins that look like Egyptian ruins or Athens ruins. There's going to be all this stuff on Mars after we take pictures of it. And one of the pictures that came back was this face and everyone freaked out. And if any of you are around my age, um, you remember that they sold entire Time Life books and DV, or sorry, VHS sets. Um, discussing all of the potential for alien life. Turns out there is really fascinating stuff like water on Mars, uh, but we didn't discover that until decades later. Uh, and the reason that people saw this is that it's we really wanted it and we wanted it so bad and we really um, wanted to see a face. And what they actually saw, and surprise, surprise, as, as technology got better, the it just was a mountain. <laughs> We've seen it from all angles, too, because we sent the rovers up. But it's really fascinating to me that there was an entire culture around this one face on Mars um, that really brought people together in a rude way. Um, so why is this? You know, one of the leading theories is that we had to quickly, as humans, realize if there was another human in the woods versus a saber-toothed tiger that was about to eat us. Um, and we recognize two eyes and a mouth on the face so strongly that we can actually see it and almost anything. Um, and you can actually see, you can actually see and hear, like I can hear that USB one in the middle screaming, um, that doorknob, I can, I feel like he's gonna be talking to me, the coffee, you kind of feel like you have to have a conversation with it before you drink it. Um, and at the bottom, like these are just shadows on a garage uh, that create like a illusion of a face. And so it's so strong that I can take this symbol, which you know, everybody knows is a percentage symbol, and I can shift it around and we have an entire emotion, um, you know, meh or meh. And it's so strong that even from the very beginning of the internet, and some people are theorizing before the internet with typewriters, that when we say something, we have to send a smiley face or a sad face or an emoji of some kind, just so that the other person on the other line can understand what face we are making. It's a key part of our communication. Now, you might be wondering, Candace, why are you talking about this? One, it all started when one of my painting teachers told me just randomly, like, hey, Candace, we see faces first out of everything. And then he just kind of moved on. And it just stuck with me from there. So I've been a little obsessed with figuring out everything and reading as much as I can about this, uh, this phenomena that we as humans have. But two, these are two photos from uh, one on the left is a photo that an SF Chronicle reporter took of all of the mailers that she got in a one month period in San Francisco. Um, and on the right is my apartment's mailbox, uh, recycling box in my mail area um, 
and that's only one week's worth of mailers. So these are who I compete with. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, we're always seeing faces and tail at design of very many vehicles I'm following. That's totally true, Wesley. There is a specific car that looks very angry. Um, and there's another car that I think that looks like he's happy all the time or she's happy all the time. Um, it's, it's that powerful that you can't unsee it. So this is what I'm competing with. And so one of the really quick ways that you can kind of like hack people's brains um, is to use a photo and use a really good photo. And I think a lot of people don't realize that good design begins with the photo. So whether it's, are you at the beginning of a campaign, can you make sure that a good photographer, you pay a good photographer to be there to get good photos of your per of your candidate or of the people that are on the ground doing the work and organizing? Um, or are you finding really good stock photos if you don't have the ability to take photos? Do you have really great photos that represent people? This is one good way, one quick and easy way that you can already um, elevate your designs and make sure that they stand out in a literal crowd of trash. So another thing that I wanted to go over is clarity and how people, uh, another way that you can make sure that your designs are, you know, readable. So I'm going to show you um, a couple of different recipes, and I'd like for you to tell me which one that you think that people voted was the easiest recipe. So let's go with recipe A as an alpha. Recipe B as in beta. And recipe C as in Candace. Not gonna lie, I couldn't come up with another C just now. <laughs> so A, B, and C. Which one do you think that people actually said was the easiest to do? Getting C's in the chat. Um, yeah, and it's pretty obvious what I'm doing here, right? Lots of C's in the chat. A, maybe for some people. Um, A, B, and C. And so one of the big things that I'm just trying to get across is that readability affects perception. Not just the fact that they can read it, but people will actually say, like, uh, these are the same exact, if you haven't figured it out, these are the same exact recipes that I've just done in different types of fonts and colors. And in this case, like in the case of B, con really low contrast. Um, so the typeface and visibility, Edwin just popped in, um, is correct. Like, that's what I'm trying to talk about here. But it's really interesting because from a just a base psychological level, um, <clears throat> in 2008, they did a study of people trying to sign up for healthcare on websites and they were testing it out. And uh, if something is hard to do, people just think that the entire thing is hard to do. So if you, if you work in tech or you have, um, you know, do volunteer, you might've heard the term like low bar um, and making sure that the bar is easy enough to cross. And so like, for example, if you are doing a volunteer event and you make it extremely hard for somebody to sign up to volunteer, they're going to then think that it is then very hard to volunteer. Um, <clears throat> and this is something that's really fascinating to me because not only is it like one, you wanna get your information out, but two, if somebody actually has to struggle to read something like this that um, B, Jennifer said that she can't even read B, um, if you are squinting your eyes and struggling just to see this, then you're actually just gonna potentially like mentally give up on it or you might just think it's not worth it, I'm just gonna eat chips again. Uh, why should I bother boiling eggs? Um, and so one really way, easy way to make it easy to read, <clears throat> design for accessibility and inclusion. And there was a really great uh, panel, I'm sorry, there was a really great panel yesterday on this. Um, and so I definitely encourage you to read, like to go back and watch the video when they put it up. Um, and I think that more, more and more people talking about accessibility and inclusion is really good. And it's one of my passions as far as, you know, when I'm designing stuff, to make sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so I think you should definitely check that out. I'm gonna rewatch it myself to make sure I caught everything, but an easy way to make sure that <clears throat> almost anybody can read it is to design for accessibility and inclusion. So some of the really quick tips here, and I'm gonna publish this entire thing and put it online so that you guys can see it. Um, but if you wanna take screenshots of this, that's great too. So real easy, you know, high contrast, <clears throat> don't use color alone to convey important information. Now, you might be asking yourself, Candace, you're using color here. It's like, yes, I absolutely am. But uh, I am not, for example, changing the word accessibility into another color 
to highlight. If I wanted to highlight something, a lot of times what I might do is either change the color so much that the contrast is totally different, or you put like a block behind it um, and you change the contrast that way. <clears throat> you just really don't want it to be like, if somebody is colorblind, for example, if the most important thing, like a warning, is only a warning because it ha it's in red versus the other colors, you might want to rethink that because if they can't read it, then you're not going to be helping that person out. Um, make text easy to read, you know, clear fonts, big enough. Uh, I, there was a part, there's a time in the early 2010s that low contrast websites were really trending, which looked really slick, but it also meant that a big chunk of the population just couldn't read it. <clears throat> And this is called the curb cut effect. And so for those of you that have worked in universal design or accessibility, have heard this term before. But what it means is that you see this, uh, you know, this curb cut here, which is originally meant to help people in wheelchairs get on and off the sidewalk. And also those bumps are meant to help people who are blind use, uh, you know, use their feet or use the, um, the walking stick to kind of sense the rolling stick to kind of sense where the curb is. Both of those things are designed for people who are disabled. Now, what's great about this is that the disa disabled people can use it as well as everyone else. So if you've ever used one of these curb cuts and you had a rolling bag <clears throat> and it helped you out, you didn't have to lift the bag, you can thank curb cut effects for that. Um, if you've ever stood on one in the rain and those little dots help grip your shoes a little bit better, that's the curb cut effect. Um, and another really easy way to think about this is if you build a ramp versus a staircase, everybody can use the ramp, but not everybody can use the staircase. Um, so they're just really quick ways. Uh, elaborate on not using color alone to highlight important information. It's like, I think it's okay. What I mean is, um, <clears throat> what I, infographics are a little different because you're trying to like, get information out and, and do different things. One thing I would check is one, make sure that you can, if you were to make it black and white, like, is it still understandable as a graph? Um, could you like, or do they all become the same color? That's one really quick way. Another thing that when I'm talking about this is I mean, like if you're trying to highlight a certain word, especially if it's like a warning to jump out, don't just rely on color, try and rely on like bumping up the contrast either by putting like a black box behind it, kind of like this curb cut effect um you know and, and making it stand out but the big thing is like if you have an infographic if you were to and i'll show you some tools later on um on how to do it but like if the contrast isn't high enough then somebody who had who can't see a lot will just see a pie graph for example that's all one color and that's the one thing that you just don't want to avoid i hope that answers your question amelia i will have time at the end um to i will have time at the end to do some q a so maybe we can get a little bit more into that um, so before I go into this, uh, any other questions about anything else that I just talked about? Because I'm going to go into my design process because I realized that's something that when I first started out as a designer, I always wanted to know other people how they designed. Underlining as well. Yeah. There's a lot of really fun ways that you can play around with it. Okay, great. I'm going to move on. Um, so just a really quick primer on my personal design process. And this is different for everybody. I'm sure people in here have figured out what works for them. Uh, I'm not saying that this is universal, but I think that it helps to find out how other creatives work. And I love reading about how other creatives work and um, seeing how that happens. So this, uh, I'm going to start out here. The first part of the design process is one, having my client or colleague fill out a design survey. And that can be, uh, you know, sometimes for logos, it's like a really big, long document. And I want you to help me find out like what messaging you have and whatnot. If it's just like a small flyer, it might just be as quick as like a Slack message and just telling me, okay, what is this for? Um, what are the resources? Where will this be? What's the size? <clears throat> In this example, I'm going to use this task where I'm going to be making a poster for a giveaway at an event that combines the concepts from three talks. Um, SETI satellites using art in classrooms and Oakland public transportation history. If this sounds really random, it's because it is. It's an actual poster that I designed for uh, Nerd Night, which is a, it happens across the country before COVID, but um, it's essentially TED Talks at bars that happen every month. Um, and they're really fun to go to once COVID, it, you know, once it's safe to go, I'd recommend checking them out. But I help make the uh, posters for these events, one, to, you know, help my friend out, but two, I always use it as a way to like 
try out new things that maybe I can't try on political design. So I'm going to show it to you here. So second, I like to survey the resources and figure out what I don't have and how to get it. So for example, if we're going back to <clears throat> what I want to combine SETI satellites using art and classroom in Oakland public transportation history, I know that I can get a SETI satellite photo for free because um, it's a government photo. Um, I have the text, the actual content, and I realize I need to find some kind of fine art image and some kind of streetcar image. Um, so I start looking for inspiration and I gather, you know, I start brainstorming. And this process for some people, it means on pen and paper. For other people, it means staring off into the distance and just waiting until something hits you. Other people, you might need to take a walk, go for a drive. Um, it, it works different ways for different people. Some st I've had some of the best ideas I've ever had while I was sitting on a bus. Um, and I had to put it into my phone. I've also had some of the best ideas I've ever had while watching a movie or playing a video game. Um, so in this case, I would look at the pictures and I'm like, ooh, I really like the sunset color palette. I like how the silhouette is happening. I think I'm gonna use those things. Um, and then the next step is sketching and initial designing. And again, sketching can be in a notebook, it can be on Illustrator, Canva, whatever you have, and maybe just moving stuff around and seeing how it lays out. And maybe you're gonna get ideas because it's like, oh, this picture is really good. It's a high res photo. The other photo I have is really bad. It's not as high res. I have to make that smaller. There's a lot of decisions that sometimes just kind of come naturally because of what you have. Um, and then there's the drafts and feedback loop. And so this part can be really quick or it can take months, right? Depending on how big of a project this is, uh, you have to have everyone who makes the decisions about it come back and say, like, I like this. Um, I, you know, like green for Oakland. Oakland days, I chose green, uh, but it looked too much like money. So I tried purple um, and I, you know, just playing around with a lot of stuff and going back and forth. And then the final version, polishing and iterations and combining everything together. Um, and this was the final poster. And again, like I said, the main point of the poster was actually to be a giveaway at the event. So I know I was talking earlier about readability, but one of the main things that I did here was since it wasn't something that was supposed to stop people on the street, I had fun with putting the words on the actual, like photoshopping it onto the actual like cable um, cable car um, and had a lot of fun with that. And I know that I just went over this and it might seem like I just said, here's how you do a flyer, you draw some circles and then you draw the rest of the owl. Um, apologies, but one of the things that my, one of my art teachers taught me was, you know, when somebody asks you how long did it take you to design that, I like to say, six hours and 10 years. So it took me six hours from beginning to end to do this flyer, but it also took me 10 years to get to a point where I can do it in only six hours. Um, so if something takes you a little longer because you're starting out, don't feel bad about it because think about that as an investment in time. Like maybe you took an extra two hours to do something because you're trying to figure out how to cut something out in Photoshop. Or maybe you took an extra hour because you got lost checking out all the different color palettes. And I think that's totally fine because it'll be faster every single time you do it. So one of the things that I always encourage creatives, especially when you're starting out, is try not to compare yourself um, with others as far as like how quickly you can do something um, because it's not as important as making sure that you know what you're getting out of it. And maybe it's that you're learning something or maybe it's that you're perfecting something. Um, yeah, that's one of my small little tips. And then I'm going to go over some of the basic elements of design. And this is so that you know how to talk about design. Uh, even those of you that aren't a designer or having to do design in this group, if you need to talk about designs with other designers, here are just some of the basic elements. So first of all, there's line, <clears throat> which seems real basic. I mean, it is one of the, the most basic, basic things. Um, <clears throat> and a line, you know, lines can do a lot of different things. It can give you stability. It can separate entire things. Again, that proximity thing, right? You can separate different items from each other so that they're not related to each other. It draws the eye and it's energetic uh, motion. Any guesses in the audience about why a horizontal line is stability um, and a vertical line is like energetic? <clears throat> I'm gonna use this moment to have a sip of water. I don't think I have any guesses yet, but one of the biggest things is actually um, horizon. So if you think about a horizon and you're standing there, uh, we have like, you know, psychologically deep down, we see a line going all the way across as basic 
horizon and it's stable and it's the floor and it's not moving. Um, okay, great. Uh, because we read horizontal, I think the chat's just a little behind. Uh, we read horizontally, it draws our attention and focus. Horizontal is like a ground, lying down versus standing up, excellent. Another theory about why vertical lines um, make us think about energy is, you know, like rockets, obviously, but even before rockets, trees go straight up, light, um, you know, like geysers, there's a lot of movement, a lot of energy requires something to go straight up. And so we think of that. And then obviously, the uh, incline gives us the idea of mountains or a bird taking flight, um, and that's motion. And then the other, uh, another um, basic part element of design is shape. So that can be as simple as a circle. It can be as complicated as like a bike icon. It can be the bike icon taken away from the circle. It can be, um, you know, like things on top of each other. So this is your basic shapes. Color is also another basic element of design, um, <clears throat> if that wasn't obvious. But what uh, one thing that I find fascinating is that uh, when you say neutrals, like a lot of people think white and black and grays, but neutrals also can include brown and beige because of one, the ground trees, but also people, um, people's skin tones. Like you can think of it that way too. Is like people think of like their skin tone as a neutral color. You like beige being used a lot. Texture is also really a uh, way to bring more interesting things to your design. So it can be as obvious as like textual, like grunge texture to using photos as texture like uh, pictures of wood planks um, and then gradients which are kind of the new hotness right now where they are already going out of style I'm not quite sure it's always kind of moving uh, we're on a 20-year cycle so i'm kind of waiting for the gradient and 3d stuff to come back with a vengeance pretty soon and then there's typography so this you know we only have an hour together so i obviously can't go over every single thing but typography is one of those things that you can take an entire course in um, as with like color and shapes and whatnot, obviously, but typography is a really interesting um, thing. And one thing I will say about that is just remember what I said before about pattern recognition. And when you're choosing your type, think about what other, um, think about what other thing, like what, what do you want to be associated with? So as an example, Barack Obama in 2007, uh, sorry, 2008, I think is when he started using the font Gotham, which uh, then started perpetuating everywhere because everybody wanted to look like the Barack Obama logo for a really long time. And so you started seeing Gotham a lot, which is similar to this. It's not exactly this, but it's very similar to this top uh, font called Poppins. And then um, because of that, if you wanted to not look like Barack Obama, one of the ways that you could do that is to obviously go in the other direction, which is these serif fonts. Um, so it's kind of it kind of is like fashion where fashion is on 20 year cycles where you'll have something that's really in fashion for a while and then it'll look boring to people and then they'll choose another thing. So I actually, um, AOC, I didn't do any of her branding or anything, but I love it. And I think a lot of, you're starting to see that her effect um, and her influence of being such a high, um, high visibility campaign and having really great design, you're, you're starting to see a lot of those, um, what she, and she obviously was inspired by a lot of previous designs and a lot of, um, a lot of movements before her. And so, but now a lot of smaller campaigns on the ground, like city council races, mayors, a lot of those are starting to do some of the more similar stuff. So you're starting to see a lot more, you know, uh, diagonal blocks with all caps. Um, you're starting to see everything. Um, are there certain, good question, Jennifer, are there certain fonts that are more accessible than others? I was told to stay away from Sarah fonts. That's not necessarily true. It is hard to say like, there's a hard and fast rule, but um, sans serif fonts are more readable if you're doing like all caps, for example. Um, sans serif fonts aren't necessarily less readable. It's just that there are some, like for example, this one is very decorative, right? Um, but there are like some really basic sans serif fonts like Times New Roman that are very readable. Um, it just depends on how you're using it. Like, and sans serif fonts should never be like all caps those are really not as readable unless they're short words like a name um so i think it's it depends on readability um yeah and actually it's funny so somebody in the chat just said i think you want fonts with that rounded end no comic sense that is uh i actually a lot of people always think that i'm going to just come in here and hate on comic sans um and i honestly i think it has a place and a time and a place it was created 
for teachers um, to be used in classrooms. And it's, you know, it looks a little comic-y, but it is actually one of the more readable fonts in some for some people um, because it's just so easy to read and it kind of has a whimsy to it. So I'm not, I never would use it, for example, on a professional thing, but I don't hate somebody who has to use it because that's the font that they have access access to and they want to print like a sign for a classroom or something. Um, I think the joke is just, is that Comic Sans is just so overused. And there are some really cool like fonts that are very close to Comic Sans if you still want that whimsy without using Comic Sans. Um, yeah, Comic Sans is making a big comic uh, comeback because of irony, somebody's saying. But also um, Impact for a long time was kind of the go-to font, which it looks similar to this one down here, this um, this third one. But uh, in because of the you know late 2000s and to now, uh, people only as associate that font with memes because it's the one that was used on a lot of the cat memes, uh, the I can hash cheeseburger memes and whatnot. Um, oh great, Hannah just put in the check out in the chat. She put a link for um, there's a new font for dyslexic readers called Open Dyslexic. Thanks so much. That's cool. I'll check that out. Um, Okay, great. I'm gonna stop there for a second. And does anybody have any questions about fonts? I know there's a bunch. Yeah, there's also like a lot of times where you wanna just use the font because you just found a new one and it looks cool, right? Um, and then the last part, uh, like the last thing when you're talking about graphic design is layout. Um, and a lot of people, when they're actually talking about graphic design, they mean like laying out. Um, and when you're laying out, one of the big things that you want to do is like look for balance. And so what do I mean there? So I'm going to show you two different slides. This one's super loud. Right. And this one's very quiet. And I think any guesses as to why this feels loud and this quiet. I'll just move on. I know I think the chat's a little bit delayed. Um, so this is loud because it, it's very crowded and it doesn't really give you time to think versus quiet has a lot of negative space. So you actually have um, have time to like think about the thing that's on the page and it gives you time. So there's two different art movements here that I want to talk about very quickly. There's Haravakui, which is, um, you know, it fills up every little piece of space on something and a lot of it a lot of it came from when you had a big piece of stone and you had a patron and they were paying you to do it and you wanted to fit as much information as possible into one area versus minimalism which was like a reaction to a lot of the other stuff that was going on in the world now i'm not saying that one of these is better than the other they both have their own place in everything but they are conveying information in a much different way um, in a more day-to-day -day version of this think about when you walk into on the left a thrift store that is packed to the gills and it has items every single place um, versus like a high-end jean store that they're going to give you space and you're going to go in there and there's going to be like a couple of people who are going to be helping you out and you can try stuff out and it's very quiet maybe there's like some nice music playing um, and these are not neither of them are bad they're just different they're giving you different feelings right like the stuff on the right is obviously expensive the stuff on the left is obviously cheap if you switched it and you went to a high-end jean store and it looked like the one on the left, you'd be very confused. Or if you went to a thrift store and they only had this left, it's like, are you guys closing? Did I walk in when you were moving? Um, and people expect different things. And so what I'm saying here is that when you're doing information, there, you know, if you want just one thing to be the most important thing, you have to have as little information as possible versus maybe you want to have as much information as possible because it's like a flyer that um, somebody's just going to be reading off of or they just need to find facts quickly there are different reasons to use different things and you have to and a lot of people always ask me candace what is the best kind of like what do you say is good design and my answer is always does it answer what you needed it to answer um and so if somebody says like there's a hard and fast rule like it always has to look minimalist that's not true sometimes you need to make a one pager that has tons of information because it's not meant for a, it's not meant for the population at large, but it's meant for your volunteer who's sitting at 
uh, you know, a phone bank and needs to answer questions. And they, if you give them something that's over-designed and has only like one thing on it, that's not going to help them. Um, so think about it that way. So never, don't give yourself just like one rule, um, you know, design for what the task is. And I think it'll help you out. I hope that I'm not just throwing out a lot of stuff. Um, I do want to give us a lot of time to go over um, questions at the end. And I know we're kind of coming up on it. So just give me one second here. Um, another reason, and so one way that you can make sure that you're, you know, like one, give everything a lot of space, but two, utilize weight. And how I said before about balancing proximity also makes something in size and darkness makes something feel like heavy um, versus super light. And the reason for this too is just imagine that you're standing on that flat horizon that we were talking about earlier and the big boulder that's super dark and super close to your face is the heaviest thing versus the cloud that's in the sky and far away feels like it's light, even though scientifically that cloud's probably super heavy. Um, your brain thinks of it as light and airy. So when you're doing designs, just think about like, do you wanna give somebody more space and more light and airy um, time to think about something or do you wanna have them move from area to area on your design? Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second there and answer any questions that people might have about everything that I just went over. And if not, I'm gonna move on to the last part. Great, Clara. So uh, talk about how political design is different than other types of design. In some ways it's not, you know, like um, in a lot of ways, the same basic tenets of design apply everywhere else. But good question. I'm actually gonna share this screen now. Um, So a lot of political design is about communication, right? Like um, a lot of what you have to deal with is like, how do you how do you present a person or let's say it's a candidate, right? Um, one of the biggest things that you wanna do is you have to figure out a lot, like for me, the biggest difference between political design and non-political design is that you have the benefit of a lot of other teams like messaging, polling, uh, data that can usually inform it. So um, like for example and the quickness of it that's i think the biggest in that answer that's kind of your question too edwin um the biggest thing is compared to like if i was working at nike i don't have the benefit of testing out five different things sometimes sometimes you have to just turn around two different advertisements that just have a person's face and a message but yeah um the message has been tightened by the messaging department or the communications department and they're really helping you and i think one of the biggest things is realizing that in uh, political design, your stuff is not usually standing alone. Usually it's um, being assisted by an organizer on the ground who's saying the same exact sentence and you're just kind of there to help repeat. So like there's an organizer on the ground saying the same exact sentence as you're putting in a billboard, for example, um, using the same photo. I think it's a lot of hitting somebody up like five times with the exact same design in, in different places. Um, and the approach is just the quickness. Like the the super fast turnaround um, is kind of the hallmark of a lot of design. And so um, best practices you have around quick design. Canva, Gabriella, I actually, um, we don't really have time today to go over Canva as much, but one thing I will say is a lot of these, a lot of the same concepts about like good design and making sure that you communicate effectively can be used across all different types. Um, but for Canva, one of the, I think especially if you're just starting out, don't be afraid to use templates. And then if you wanna play around with something, change one thing at a time. So like, if you're like, I wanna use this template, but I wanna make it more my own, try to change like just the typography or try to change just the color. And then um, the reason why I say that is, especially if you're just starting out, you wanna just change one major uh, design element at a time. Um, and then as you get more and more advanced, Play around with everything um, and then you'll start not having to use the template okay great so let me go over just these two slides and then i'll open it up for questions um, so communication during the design process is really important um, so if you're hitting a wall with others and others could be candidate uh, you know the comms team clients other people on your creative team other people on your digital team try these questions right like and i think this is where um, a lot of times you'll be hitting a wall because you're like, 
doing another version and they still hate it, doing another version, they still hate it, but they're not telling you why they don't like it. And I, I don't know if this rings true for anybody in here, um, but it's one of the worst things is when I hear like, I don't like it, but I don't know why. If you hear that, this is what you do. Ask them some of these questions. What parts of this do you like? What parts of this make you react strongly? If you could rank the items on this page in order of how important they should be, how would you? Show me a design that you like. Could you set that for me? So I, you don't have to, don't ask all of these at the same time, but I think what it happens is a lot of times, especially in political design, if something's not resonating correctly, a lot of times it maybe it feels like somebody didn't feel like they had the right buy-in. Maybe there's somebody on the communications team that um, only just saw it now and they're like, oh, there's all this other stuff that I think you need to put into here and how do we do that? And this is a good way, like I think I found uh, my successes as a designer come from when I'm communicating really well with people. And I think sometimes you just gotta step back and just be like, hold on, don't, and also what it has helped me too, and I should have put this in here is just to say, um, yes, Jennifer, I'll make sure to, I'll, pu I'll publish this entire thing and I'll put it in the chat. I think the chat will still work. Um, what parts of this don't you like? What parts of this make you react strongly? Just being able to ask questions like that and just stepping back to and saying like, you know, it helps alleviate a lot of this stuff for me. And it may or may not work for you depending on how much of an artist you are. As I say like, look, I'm an artist. I get told all the time that my stuff's not great and I'm used to it. I am not gonna take it personally. I will, I do need you to tell me why you don't like something. And a lot of times, sometimes people don't wanna hurt other people's feelings. Um, and you want to make sure that they know that it's totally okay for you to be like, I really hate this color because I would rather somebody tell me that they hate a color than to be like, I don't know why I don't like it. Try something else. Um, if you're hitting a personal creative wall with yourself, try these questions. So if you take a look at it through fresh eyes, if you knew nothing about a campaign event person, what would I currently think of them after looking at this? Are the colors helping or hurting here? Is the photo that I'm using the best for this? What is my personal taste versus the best for design? Um, as an example, I absolutely love Star Wars and I love Sith stuff. So like I have to prevent myself from using black and red everywhere because I love the combination black and red. And it's almost like never use black and red. Do do I need to, and these are the, these last two questions I think are the biggest two questions if you keep hitting a, a creative wall. One, do you need to take a breather? There are so many times where you're overworking something and you need to go play a video game, read a book, go for a walk, watch TV, whatever you do that chills you out, puts you someplace else, take in somebody else's creativity um, that has nothing to do with what you're doing. A lot of times this will do wonders for you. Do you need to sleep on it if you have the time? Even if you don't have time, take a 15 minute break, look at something else and then come back to it. That sometimes will help you out a lot. Um, and then the final question, because I'm a Filipina, my mom would be so happy that I'm putting this. Did you eat yet? Because number one thing, did you eat yet? Did you drink water? Did you eat? You might have forgotten and it'll help you out. So um, with that, I'm actually going to publish this right now and then I'm going to send it to the host and she's going to help me um, send this to you. I'm going to publish this online so that you guys can see it. And then, uh, but yeah, uh, we have five minutes left. So I wanna, I'm sorry, it's not too much time, but I do wanna take some questions for you. Yeah, sometimes you make five versions and you have to walk away and come back to decide what's best. It's totally true. Um, does anybody have any questions? Ah, Heather, I see you've been asked that question. <laughs> Uh, fun fun fact, I was a vegetarian in uh, high school and my grandma asked why, just why. Um, what are some easy to you learn design tools? Actually, I did put this, hold on. She's gonna put this in here and I actually have um, some slides at the end that I will just show on here. I didn't wanna take up Q and A time with this, but um, So uh, some easy to, you know, free design, easy to learn design tools on, on this thing. And she'll put the link in there. Um, there is like free fonts, 
free photos. Check out your local library's website. I just found out, like, for example, San Francisco Library has all these free San Francisco historical photos. Um, there's color palettes, icons, photo software and design software that you can actually, um, a lot of you use Canva. I think that's a very easy one to learn, but uh, you can actually use like stuff like Google Slides and PowerPoint to make really good editable flyers. Um, Creative Conference Common Stock, I, yeah, Library of Congress actually um, has some really good stuff. That's where I got that photo of the Oakland um, car. Is there a book? guide to better understand how color palettes influence emotions? That's really fascinating. Um, there are, there's actually this book called, um, and I'll, maybe I should add, I can add stuff to this too, but there's a book that's like, hundred things that designers need to know about humans and that has a lot of different things in there. I will say about colors, um, there isn't something that universally, I know that there are, some people think that some colors are universal. That's not quite true because different cultures view the same color and different people. So as an example, um, I'm in San Francisco, orange and black. Yes, that reminds me of Halloween, but it also reminds me of the San Francisco Giants. If you're Chinese, red means something totally different. Red and gold means something totally different than somebody who's like a San Francisco 49ers fan. Um, and so, and by the way, we're hitting our end here. I will, I'm going to stay here a couple of minutes after one for, uh, 345. I apologize for going over. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of other, and this is, this will be in that link that the host just, that Jen just put in there. Um, accessibility, there's like, color blindness simulators, color contrast checker, if you spell with a U, um, we are colorblind, I think that, and then Adobe Color, which is like a place where you can get a lot of free palettes, they have now a contrast checker in there too. So if you like two different colors, you can see if they work for most people. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that is on that link. And if you, also if you tweet at me, I think I put my Twitter in there um, and it's on my bio, or if you message me, I will send it to you too. Um, and then tomorrow, I'm also going to be on a panel. If you actually, if you just search tomorrow, just do a command F or control F for the word design. I'm on a panel about designs and democracy talking about some of the, um, and I'm with a couple of other really amazing people who were talking about like why we do certain things or like what kind of caveats and to avoid and like other parts, the other side of design, which is like the people part. Um, and the political part of it. I really love all of the info that you guys are sharing in this chat too, like creative comments on Splash Pixabay. Um, oh, there's also like new ones that are popping up. Like, a, you know, um, there are like one of my friends runs like, for example, like a, a weed, like a marijuana stock photo site. Cause she wants to make sure that the stock photos, people that are smoking marijuana actually look like the people that use it every day. Um, Coolers.co. Yep. Cassie. Any other questions? I'm going to stay on just for a couple of minutes more, but thank you so much. I appreciate everybody. Um, and I hope you got something from this. And I hope one of the biggest things that you take away from this is that you can use anything to design, like don't get too stuck on the actual program, but really think about like the concepts and really focus on like accessibility and readability and that'll help you. Um, Great. Yeah. And that's my contact information. You can, message me. Uh, I respond, my DMs are open on Twitter uh, for now. <laughs> so go ahead and DM me or message me on the app. I am actually using the app pretty regularly. So thank you everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful NetRoots. And especially if it's your first time at NetRoots, welcome and enjoy the fun and uh, enjoy all the wonderful talks.